All right, I'm good to go. I have the spreadsheet up, and I have you up, and I have coffee. Um, do you need anything else? <laughs> I couldn't tell if you were being cheeky. Always being cheeky. Oh, are we are we British? Um, is that an overly overly British word to use? If so, then I guess for now we are. Elliot, this is. I don't know. I don't know if you missed this and all of the polling averaging you've been doing, but this is America. Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk and happy 538 Polling Average Day. Yes, that's right. Today we are launching our state and national polling averages. From this day forth, there will be no more poll by poll freakouts. Everyone will say, put it in the average and move on, and that will be that. Of course, I kid, there will still be many freakouts, but you, dear listener, need not participate because you have the 538 averages at your fingers. In fact, you can go check them out right now at 538.com. But if you're more of an auditory learner, as of 3 p.m. on April 24th, Trump leads Biden nationally by half a percentage point, so roughly a tie, in the Sun Belt states of Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and maybe add North Carolina to the Sun Belt states, Trump leads Biden by, on average, four to six percentage points. In the northern battleground states of Pennsylvania and Michigan, Trump leads by about a point. And Wisconsin is the only state where Trump doesn't lead. There, it is a dead heat. Nationally, RFK Jr. pulls in about 10 percentage points of support and he's in the high single digits in the battleground states. Some quick caveats before we dive in. We are, of course, more than six months away from Election Day, so these numbers are liable to change, and possibly quite a bit between now and November 5th. There are also margins of error around these numbers, which we're going to get into. These numbers also don't take into account the possibility of a systemic polling error. That is the job of an election forecast, which is, of course, forthcoming. So without further ado, here with me to discuss is Director of Data Analytics, Elliot Morris. Welcome to the podcast, Elliot. Hey, Galen. Happy to be here and unleashing our average upon the world. Um, Yeah, so it's one of those things where, like, you raise a child and then you, like, set it out in the world and you don't know what impact it's going to have. You hope for the best, but uh, any worries? (laughs) The model could be a sociopath. We're just not sure yet. We have to see how it behaves around animals. Um, oh boy. Uh, okay. I also want to say that if you have questions about these averages specifically or about the election in general, you know where to reach me podcasts at 538.com or of course on Twitter. So Elliot, first, a more personal question. Did any of these averages surprise you or did you learn something that you didn't know while doing this exercise of putting together the averages? Well, in terms of the results, I think the most striking findings for most people are going to be this divergence between the more sunbelt, as you call them, or non-white states uh, and those white battlegrounds. I mean, there's a five or four to five percentage point difference between those two groups of um, of states on average, and it's counterintuitive. Uh, the Democrats have been gaining ground with non-white voters for the last decade uh, until really until this sort of U-turn. Uh, in 2020 and potentially in 2024. So that is a narrative breaker. Trump up just one point in Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, and Michigan on average, but up five in Georgia and North Carolina. I do think that's going to be surprising to people. And is that specifically about racial dynamics, which is to say Biden's numbers are holding up better amongst white voters and deteriorating amongst voters of color? Or is that also education polarization. I mean, I know places like Nevada are don't have high degrees of four-year college degree attainment, for example. Um, is that playing into this, or is this really a story of actually racial polarization decreasing? Yeah, uh, we don't have cross-tab averages, so I can only speculate. Uh, I can use some anecdotes. What I'll say is um, there seems to be two... Three things going on. Yeah, there's Democrats losing a little bit of ground uh, with non-white voters, including black and Hispanic voters. Uh, It seems to be less than what was sort of hyped up a couple of months ago as maybe a 40 percentage point change or something among this group. I mean, maybe it's five. Uh, The changes 
on margin in all these states is only five points total. So you just by definition can't have a like tsunami of change in any one subgroup. So uh, for racial polarization, yeah, there's there's less racial polarization. It does seem to be coming disproportionately among the less educated voters in the population. So that's why you might get um, uh, bigger decreases in Nevada and Arizona, where overall ed- educational attainment is lower than in the Midwestern states. So uh, that's, I think, part of the narrative. And then white voters, yeah, they're they're different in different regions of the country. Um, they're more uh, they're more secular in the north than they are in the south. So maybe Biden's doing better with those. They're of course slightly better educated, um, and they have closer ties to like working class politics. Um, that have been traditionally associated with with uh, democratic gains, stuff you know, somebody like a union, for example, if to use a heuristic. So, uh, I think you add all that up together, and the Democratic Party today looks a little bit wider, uh, and it, it looks more working class with white voters, but not with non-white voters. So, uh, we see that in some cross tabs. Who knows? Right? You say we're far out from the election. Who knows if that'll persist? But that seems to be the explanation today. To be clear, if today were election day and these polls were accurate, Trump would win the Electoral College and for that matter would win the national popular vote by a half a percentage point. Uh, of course, as we've mentioned, there are six months plus until election day. But when we look at the Electoral College math, it looks like Biden would have to win Wisconsin, where it's a dead heat, Pennsylvania and Michigan and could lose the rest of the states that we've discussed here in order to reach 270. Which of those three upper Midwestern slash Rust Belt states would be the tipping point state in this scenario. So today it's Michigan, uh, where Biden, where Trump leads Biden by 1.3 percentage points. Uh, And again, right, like, don't take that to the bank. We're going to get into that. Um, But at least Michigan's the most Republican of the northern battlegrounds right now. It's the state that Trump wins sort of first um, in order, in ordering. And that's the one that gives him the, the 270th Electoral College vote. Pennsylvania is right behind that at minus one. Uh, so it could be either of those. But Wisconsin looks to be the bluest, which I think is a little surprising if you were looking at those tipping point probabilities in 2016 and, uh, and 2020. Well, Elliot, it may not be surprising if you're familiar with the history of polling error in <laughs> Wisconsin. So uh, I mean, we can di- <laughs> dive right into that if we want to. I mean, we have seen some pretty messed up polling in Wisconsin of all states you know, I'm sure we will discuss this more as we get closer to Election Day. But the error nationally in the past two presidential elections has been somewhere more in the range of like two to four points. But part of the reason that people have sort of realized that it seems like the polling error is larger than that, or there have been bigger upsets than that would suggest is more because of what's happening in the Electoral College. And we've seen pretty big polling errors in some states, particularly like Wisconsin. Is there any reason to, how are you feeling about the state of polling accuracy today? Yeah, look, what the averages try to do is find the most likely trend line through all the polling data we're getting. Uh, You know, we want to know, like, just looking at the polling data, what is the state of public opinion broadly today? Um, That is to speak nothing about the quality of those measurements. Uh, which, as you say, opens a whole other can of worms. Um, we should do another podcast about this. There's a big risk factor um, when all the polls are sampling the same population of like very highly politically engaged people and response rates are less than 1%. There's a big chance of a misfire. So uh, people are going to have to keep that in mind, but that is a quantitative problem for our forecast. Right. And to be clear, there are margins of error around these polls, but that's not where the potential error comes from. It's not from either a systemic miss in the polls or the fact that we're six months away. It comes more from the fact that polls have a margin of error associated with them to begin with. So how big are those bands just to give folks an idea before we dive into the numbers further? So if you go to the website today, you'll see about a two percentage point uncertainty interval around the polling averages nationally uh, and closer to four or five percentage points at the state level. Um, And this uncertainty represents our uncertainty about uh, the state of public opinion uh, as revealed by those polls without 
accounting for any systematic bias or right or the time remaining until the election day. It's not a forecast. So that's like, uh, you know, we only have six polls or something in Michigan. Um, so they each one of those polls has their own margin of error. So what would happen if we took one of those polls out or uh, if if the result of that poll were different? How does that impact the average? Um, and we'll get into all the adjustments we make to these polls as well to try to, to try to account for biases like pollster and mode. And all of those adjustments also come with un some uncertainty. So uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do is express, right, that uh, even though we have one sort of most likely average because there's noise in the data and there's a lot of noise in this polling data this, like, this year, well, let me tell you, uh, there is uncertainty in the average as well. What is the noise? What's uh, what's the noise sound like? Uh, whoosh, bang. I don't know. All right, Something cut that. Like Let's that. make it. We're gonna. I'm gonna get a button <laughs> with that noise on it. Elliot, there had previously been some talk about a decrease in the electoral college popular vote gap, and that's in part because of this split between the Rust Belt and the Sun Belt that we've been talking about, which is that. If the Rust Belt holds up better for Biden, then there may not be as big of a, a Republican advantage in the Electoral College. Does it seem as though that has materialized based on these averages? So the polling averages today do show a decrease in the Electoral College advantage for Republicans, for, for Trump. Um, just, you know, to, to recap, Wisconsin was the tipping point in 2020. Biden won it by you know 0 0.7 percentage points or some sort and he won nationally by 4.5 so the bias there is in the high three percentage points right now the difference between the tipping point state in michigan and nationally is uh just about a percentage point although it has been jumping around a lot again caveat mTOR about all this noise so a couple of weeks ago it was closer to two percentage points now it's one it might go back up so that is a decrease that is a relative uh, improvement in the Electoral College outlook for Biden if you keep the national popular vote the same. In other words, if everything is the same in 2020 and you have this level of Electoral College popular vote divide, um, then Biden would have been, you know, favored to win more electoral votes. And this is in part because of that decrease in racial polarization that we've been talking about, right? Yeah, it's because of this increase in Biden's standing in those northern battlegrounds. Uh, if you take all the Sun Belt swing states, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and North Carolina, and you give them to Trump, he's at 268 electoral votes. Uh, that is a very close election, by the way. That is like Veep material. Uh, and if you are you trying uh, to manifest a tie in the electoral college? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I would never hope for for a particular election outcome, especially not a chaotic one. Uh, but if it happened. Uh, so, I th but if it happened, you'd have no choices but to listen to this podcast every day for two months. I'm sure people and, would uh, clip it at me ad nauseum. <laughs> he doesn't care about chaos. So, uh, so right. So at, that's 268. Trump has to win one more of those states to, to to win the electoral college. But Biden is doing better in those than than you would expect. He's doing about three percentage points better in those nor northern battlegrounds than you would expect based on how well he's doing in those southern battlegrounds. Uh, so it's it's all really up to those northern states. And hey, you pointed out earlier, the polls have been pretty bad there recently. So don't take that to the bank. But that's that's at least what the polls are saying. Yeah, which to the point of keeping an open mind about polling error, I think I always tell people we should keep an open mind about what the battleground states will be. The six states that we're talking about here are pretty it's a pretty narrow scope for understanding the election all things considered we can include you know north carolina on we can include north carolina we can include minnesota maine new hampshire there are a lot of states where if say like trump's standing improves by a point or two are in play there are some states uh you know where I mean, Biden would have to incre increase his standing significantly for him to start putting places, maybe once considered battleground states like Iowa, Ohio, or Florida in play. Um, but how does how does that polling look? Like, is Minnesota closer at this point than, say, Arizona or Georgia? So we don't have any polls in New Hampshire. We do have a couple polls in Maine and Minnesota. 
uh, and they, uh, they, you know, they, these poles are like not counterintuitive. If you just applied a uniform swing, if you if you just swung every state uh, five points towards Trump based on what is implied by the national vote, you get the same answer, and that is um, a tied race in New Hampshire and Maine, and um, you know, like a fifty fifty race in Minnesota, maybe slightly leaning towards. Uh, towards Democrats based off of the uh, residual Biden overperformance in the neighboring states. So uh, I, I think when we get to the point where we're like simulating electoral college outcomes based off of these polls and other factors, uh, there's not going to be super wide tails because there aren't a whole lot of competitive states, but uh, there will be a lot of, uh, well, we would say like mass. There's going to be a, a lot of very high probability of a close election going either way, just because of the sheer number of of competitive states. Um, look, it, it leans Trump right now the the election, as we pointed out, but uh, but yeah, there's a a lot of uncertainty around that, and especially in states where where we have no polls yet. Quantitatively, how much stock should we put in polling six months and two weeks out from election day, on average? Which is to say, how much should we expect these polls to move? Yeah, if you're trying to forecast an election with polls this early, you're going to have that time. Uh, what this is useful for is for us to uh, anchor our understanding of uh, the campaign as it exists right now and try to figure out, uh, like in a newsroom, you know, we could make coverage decisions based off of this. Oh, it looks like Maine is in play. We should probably send a reporter there. If your campaign, this is useful for you because you want to know whether or not you need to allocate resources in certain places. I think if you're a reader, this is this is important to you because, um, well, like the public opinion in general at any given moment is important. It impacts we live politics in and discourse. People think matter. We live in a society. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but it's not useful for forecasting election outcomes early. Uh, I, I mean, look, if the polls were all like plus 10 Biden, then you should calibrate your expectation for November to be a little bit more pro-Biden, not too much. Uh, and similarly, if Trump was down or Trump was up 10 in all these states, then it'd be like, oh, Biden has an uphill battle. Right now, it's all close enough that um, anything between Biden plus five and Trump plus five nationally, totally reasonable guess. Anything between, you know, 350 electoral votes either way, also totally plausible. It's It's close. So it can be useful as a signal for that, but not not really as a signal for who's going to win. So you're saying it's going to be a close election, Elliot? Uh, no, I News didn't make 11. a prediction. <laughs> <laughs> There's News at 11. <laughs> well, speaking of polling movement, folks will see if they go to 538.com that the averages are backdated to the beginning of March. So you can see how they have been moving over time already. And you'll see that Trump led Biden by two points nationally, according to the averages back on March 1st. Now, the lead is closer to a half a percentage point. I think we've already talked on the podcast about some movement towards Biden, both in terms of approval um, and whatnot. Is it clear what happened here? I mean, in the same way that we shouldn't be making a huge deal of a half a percentage point lead, we probably shouldn't be making a huge deal of a point and a half movement. Um, But if you did have to pinpoint trends over the past month and a half, what is it? Look, I, I wouldn't read too much into a movement of four or five points in in one poll or in one state, but the averages are designed to strip out the noise. Uh, you know, the the polls enter with some amount of sampling error based on how many people they interviewed. There's additional error that we're looking for uh, that, that we want to quantify, like if there's a 10 or 20 percentage point spread between the Trump margin in any of these polls, that's like a lot of noise and you don't want your average to move around. And that number actually looks closer to be, it looks closer to like 10 percentage points. So it's not worst case scenario, but that is more error than you should expect based on sampling error alone. So that is all to say the model is designed to react to signal. Um, so a two percentage point increase in Biden's vote margin or decrease in Trump's is probably significant. I think we can read into that and say, oh, this is real movement. This is real change in public opinion. So why has it occurred? Uh, I can think of a couple of hypotheses. All of these are obviously, again, speculation. Um, Trump being in the news again. 
if, if you go back and you look over the past 10 years of a chart uh, showing uh, the amount of press coverage uh, and me just media coverage in general for either Democratic or Republican candidate, so including Hillary Clinton, you see a pretty clear inverse relationship between their margin and the polls. So like media, media coverage, not good for candidates really over the last decade. Um, so that would be bad for Trump. He's in the news now uh, because of the trial. He won uh, his primary. So maybe voters are thinking more of this race as an actual Trump versus Biden contest now. So their, their uh, answers and polls are closer to their actual decision that they're going to have to make in November. Um, and maybe Biden's seeing a little bit of a state of the union bump or like a primary winning bump or a bounce if it fades. So, uh, but th that is, you know, that's all speculation. The averages really are not a tool for causal inference insofar as they help us discuss politics and identify trends, but not why. Yeah. Yeah. That's I know that's Weasley. I know Data that's Weasley. Data always tells but... us what, but it's harder for it to tell us the why. But is it, cl I guess another way of getting at the why is where is the movement? Is it amongst self-identified Democrats who had an unfavorable view of Vi Biden in March now saying they're going to vote for Biden? Is it amongst independents who genuinely didn't have an opinion a month and a half ago? Is it amongst RFK Jr. voters who we've already seen some, we're about to talk about him next, we've already seen some decline in his standing, have said, I thought I was going to vote for RFK Jr., but I discovered over the past month and a half that he doesn't align with my views on X or Y policy um is it clear where, who the movement has happened amongst yeah it is pretty parallel across all groups like i said there's a little bit more movement in in michigan and pennsylvania and wisconsin to some extent iowa as or iowa and, and ohio as well so you know you could read into, the, into that i think and say um you know maybe like the traditionally moderate swing group of voters that the you know press really likes to pay attention to for Trump's first election, maybe they're they're moving the the moderates, uh, but equally we have evidence just from the cross tabs that Biden has increased his vote share, his consolidated support among those traditionally Democratic groups, uh, especially Black and Young Americans. So, uh, you, I think I was on this podcast four or five months ago, and we were talking about whether or not we believed the horse race numbers among Young Americans, and our theory at the time was that. Uh, when people are, are, an, are answering a stranger on the phone or an empty box on the internet on their phone or their computer, they're like accessing different information in their head than they, than they will actually be putting onto a ballot in November. And at the time, that information was, uh, look how poorly Biden is doing, just in general, on the, on the economy, um, in Israel, Gaza, uh, Israel, Hamas, um, just kind of just overall he's old immigration immigration he's frail what what have you the tone was just negative so that that tone seems to be a little better now we seem to be having more recovery similarly we seem to be having more recovery in in those voters who may have been accessing those that tone more in their response but um that that's a that would be a really good survey experiment for someone to do uh, it's not necessarily answerable with the cross tabs Okay, so RFK Jr. is pulling in about 10 percentage points of support nationally. It's a little bit less in the battleground states. It's more like eight points or so. First of all, how does the pick... And to be clear, Biden is... Pull, I said the margin, but Biden is pulling at about 41 percentage point to Trump's 41 percentage point, roughly, nationally. So clearly, neither of those candidates has a majority. You get about... 82% of the electorate by adding those together, you get maybe another nine for RFK Jr. Um, that takes you close to, you know, around 92%. There's other folks who say maybe they're not voting, they're voting third party, what, whatever. How much, uh, how much does it change the race when you take RFK Jr. out altogether? What kinds of margins are we looking at? When Kennedy is included in a survey, uh, support for both Trump and Biden uh, falls by uh, about three percentage points, uh, but it falls more for Biden. It falls for about 3.4 percentage points for Biden and about three percentage points um, for Trump. Uh, so that's about 4% who like generally say, I'm going to vote for someone else. And then if you name RFK, 
uh, more people go to him. And when, when that happens, there's a penalty for Joe Biden of about uh, a quarter to a half a percentage point. 0.4 percentage point is the median estimate. There's uncertainty there. So often when we talk about RFK Jr. on this podcast, folks will say, okay, well, maybe he's pulling at 10% today, but that is probably not sustainable. He'll collapse as we get closer to election day. That's what always happens with third party candidates. Um, do you agree with that? Do you think there's any reason to expect his numbers to hold up better than past third party candidates? Yeah, in, in the research for our forecast, just to put a number on this, in late April, early May, we find that support for third party candidates tends to decrease by about half. So we should expect five percentage points of those votes to flow back to either candidate. And again, the inference from the average today is that Joe Biden would gain a little bit more from that, about um, 0.4 percentage points. So uh, we don't know if that's going to be true. Like in November, the actual composition of these voters is up for grabs. So that effect is obviously within the margin of error of zero. We don't really know. Um, but uh, if you you know if you operate on, under under the assumption that um, RFK is your typical independent candidate, then you read more into those numbers. Personally, I I think we see a little bit more uh, dissatisfaction, disaffection in politics today, especially among young voters. Uh, so uh, I've been sort of operating under this assumption using some of the cross tabs as, a, as some light anecdotal evidence for this, uh, that he does have a little more staying power among the Biden voters, among those young voters especially, uh, than maybe your Gary Johnson or your traditional Jill Stein candidacy uh, would have, which didn't seem to really take off with the same media ecosystem, the same online ecosystem that, uh, that Kennedy has today. So maybe less than a half reduction in his support. But hey, equally, he could gain. You, you never really know. Something dramatic could happen to either candidate, and it is possible that he gains ground as well. You know, one of the big takeaways from the averages for me is that neither of the major party candidates is anywhere close to 50%. And it seems like we may well end up in a situation where after November 5th, neither candidate gets a majority mandate from the public. And if you look at sort of the approval ratings of Trump and Biden today and compare it to where their polling average is, roughly, you find that the people who approve of Trump say that they're going to vote for him. The people who approve of Biden say they're going to vote for him. And that means that there's about 20 percent of the electorate that roughly is not into either. So that gets at, you know, this double hater group, people who have a negative view of both Trump and Biden and what they're going to do. They can vote for RFK Jr. or another third party candidate. They can reluctantly vote for Biden or Trump, or they cannot vote at all. Let's address that first. Do you think that this is liable to be a low turnout election, given just how poor Biden and Trump's numbers are at this moment in time? Totally. And people say they're less interested in the election now, less enthusiastic about voting for either candidate than they were in 2020, especially the Biden supporters. Um, the ones that voted for him last time. So uh, I, th I think, on honestly, I think our modal assumption should be that turnout will be lower than in 2020. People are, are kind of just tired of it. It's the same it's the same race. There's not a whole large novelty factor with Kennedy. I mean, he, if, if he was at 30%, that'd be different. Maybe that would juice turnout. Um, but uh, I don't think he brings anyone out to the polls who wasn't really already politically interested and might be drawing a lot of support from people who don't actually turn out, who say they support him, but won't really vote anyway. They just want to take that uh, su support away from Trump or Biden in the polls, uh, and they might not actually vote. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, if turnouts at 59 percent, 60 percent, I really wouldn't be surprised. That's closer to the historical average recently anyway. Versus the two-thirds turnout that we saw in 2020. Yeah, closer closer to a six percentage point decline. I mean, that'd be a lot, but it wouldn't be historically unprecedented. It's interesting that you say that it seems particularly like Biden voters are not enthusiastic to vote because when you look at, so when pollsters conduct a poll, they can look at all American adults, they can look at registered voters specifically, or they can sort of tighten the lens even further and just look at likely voters. And it appears that when you look at likely voters, Biden does a little better than if you look at registered voters, which is to say amongst the most reliable voters, amongst the likeliest of the people in the electorate to actually turn out 
Biden has more support. How large is that advantage? And is, is there any sense of why? Yeah, well, we, we know that there's, there's two correlations going on here. One is that the more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote, right? Maybe you're closer to, you know, some civic education that instilled in you this virtue to vote. Maybe you were more exposed to social groups that, that vote or media advertising or whatever. You're just more aware. Similarly, there is a correlation, especially among white voters, but among the whole country. Um, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote for Democrats. Um, so, you know, that, that is a, a robust finding. And so it's not surprising at all that as Democrats have become more reliant on educated voters, uh, that they would be doing better in elections that are lower turnout, that are uh, where it's like more important, where it's harder to have engagement from somewhere, where it's more important um, that that candidates really get the word about 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 the upcoming election. So uh, that I mean, that finding makes sense. Um, it would be it would almost be surprising if we didn't if we didn't see that these days. All right. So in case this hasn't been nerdy enough, now we're going to get a little nerdier. Let's nerd out. Super nerdy. The model that you use to calculate the averages here is formally called a Bayesian multi-level dynamic linear model, which is fit using a statistical method called Markov chain Monte Carlo, which I want to be clear. I, I totally understand what that is. Galen, please. But for, but for tell lay people. listeners, <laughs> for lay listeners, what the f*** does that mean? Galen, what do you know about the no U-turn sampler? <laughs> uh, everything. Nuts. So the thing that, that people really need to know is there's like, th I mean, there's a million different ways you could do it. Polling averages typically have followed one of three methods. One is you take all the polls and you put them in an, in an Excel spreadsheet and you average the ones that came out the last 30 days. Maybe you put a little bit more weight on the ones that came out in the last week or whatever. Um, or you can, and that's what Real Clear Politics does. Um, 538 started out doing something like that, but it quickly became more complicated with, for reasons that are justified, and we'll get into those. Huffington Post uh, and some of the more statistical, statistically minded averages do something, you know, similar to what we're doing now, which is you draw a trend line through points. Like uh, imagine your undergraduate statistics, you know, uh, the graph that has people's height on the x-axis and their weight on the y-axis as you get as you get taller you get heavier typically um and to to know exactly that relationship you would fit like a straight line through those points um so curve fitting or trend lines similar or you can combine them uh which is what 538 uh has been known for and uh, which does a pretty good job it allows you to put more weight on a more aggressive trend line closer to an election which is novel and uh and important um that's a, that's a good way to do it too. None of these methods is like wrong or right, uh, but all three of these suffer from a problem in statistics where uh, if you you know if, if if you're doing your averages in multiple steps, if you're t if you're doing your model in multiple steps where you're like taking an average and then making an adjustment and then doing an average again and putting an adjustment on that, and you're stacking all these things together, you lose the ability to reliably measure the uncertainty in your data. So we've opted for um, for a method that's a little bit more complicated so that we can take into proper account that uncertainty than the polling average. Um, at the end of the day, we are curve fitting. We are drawing a trend line through points. In fact, it's really cool the way our model works as it draws a trend line through support for all parties in all states simultaneously. And we make our various adjustments like for house effects, which I'll list properly in a second. Um, but the important thing people to know is that like we are combining the the really great elements of the way this has done been done in the past with a more sophisticated and crazily named method for doing this thing uh, that is designed to take proper account of the uncertainty and that's what you get out of the Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation that that's that's what we're uh, we've made so many improvements to accomplish. And so, what are you trying to take into account simultaneously? the sort of yeah. bias of the pollster, um, the rating according to our pollster ratings. Yeah, what so are, whenever, what else? We, whenever a poll comes out, like it, imagine you are a pollster right now and you are trying to generate a poll. Uh, what you would have to do is um, you'd have to get a list of people to call and you call them and you, you write an interview questionnaire and you interview them. Um, you weight your data somehow to make it representative to account for the aforementioned less than 1% response rate for a poll, um, and you publish it. And 
all of those choices can impact the result of the poll. Um, so we want to take into account the effects of uh, which pollster has have done this poll, which we typically call the house effect. We also find that there are systematic differences uh, in polls that are published from online sources and those that are published over the phone, especially lower quality online sources, those that don't sort of control for the for the people that are entering into the sample. Uh, so some online pollsters use representative sampling from a larger panel of people who have signed up. That's really, that's a lot better, uh, we found. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to take into account the population that's being sampled. Likely voter polls are better for predicting an election, so we adjust the polls to the population of likely voters. There's this third-party adjustment, which you've talked about for Kennedy. Um, and then there's, like, randomness. You know, a, a poll can be off due to any number of factors uh, regarding the, the sample that have been interviewed. Like, maybe they just, maybe the people who answered the phone yesterday were just weirdos. That's called sampling error. And then there's a bunch of other sources of randomness that aren't biased um, that, that can just enter your poll uh, as the as the process goes along. And that's called non-sampling error. And we, we take that stuff into account too. So honestly, if you're hearing this and you're thinking, well, it sounds like a lot of different ways a poll could go wrong. Yeah, that's the point. That's why we do a bunch of different polls and average them together. And we just want to make sure we're taking, that we're like properly measuring the impact of all of these different things that could go wrong so that we can tell stories about them and communicate about, about what's going on in the polls. So part of the considerations that the model makes blunts the effect that a possible outlier poll could have on the average. And just out of curiosity, does that have the potential to like overemphasize the conventional wisdom, right? Like tale as old as time, the week before the election, um, Ann Selzer puts out a poll in Iowa showing Trump winning by eight percentage points when the polling average shows it a dead heat. And actually, Ann Selzer's right. You know, it goes on to be a much closer election than previously expected. Of course, I'm talking about 2020 here. Um, how does the model consider that, you know, you don't want to like overfit to the conventional wisdom and end up with like a sort of herded average um, and be open to the possibility of outliers being leading indicators or something like that. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's multiple ways you, you could do this. We account for also a, a, the pollster rating, the 538 pollster rating of the pollster. So if you're a good pollster historically and you've shown, you've demonstrated empirically that your outliers are like good, reliable signals, then the model will take that into account and move closer to you than it, than it otherwise would have. But like philosophically, there's just no real way out of discounting outlier polls. If if your empirical, if your belief, and I think this is empirically correct, is that the average of polls over the long run is more accurate than any one individual poll can be over that entire period. Similarly to, you know, like how an index fund typically beats hedge funds in the stock market, then you want to average. And if you don't believe that, then you should become a pollster and do it yourself. Uh, but we uh, we tend to believe, and again, this is sort of empirically demonstrated in our work, that um, the polling, the average of, of all polls, accounting for all this other stuff and reacting properly to the amount of movement in a race as the model decides uh, is, is the better way to go about it. So, Which brings us back to, in many ways, the averages are as good as the polls. And in 2016... Obviously, the polls were off nationally by about two percentage points, but the increased error in some of the battleground states meant that the election didn't go the way that the national polls has, it has indicated, and even the, the the upper Midwestern battleground states had indicated in 2020, it was more like four percentage points. So the election still went the way that the polls indicated, but people felt like, wow, this is a lot closer than I was expecting based on the averages and the forecasts going in. And the way that we sort of explained 2016 is that, well, we weren't waiting by education. We missed this polarization along educational lines that ended up having a really big impact. And so while we may have been getting a bunch of Republicans in polls, or we may have been getting a bunch of Democrats, even in proportion to their existence within the electorate, we were getting the wrong kind. We weren't getting enough, you know, non-college educated voters in our sample. And so therefore we missed something that was happening, uh, you know, underneath the surface. In 2020, various explanations again, but one of them is COVID, right? You have an environment where 
the one party is encouraging its voters to a much greater extent to stay home and not participate in social activities and whatnot, and maybe are more available to pick up the phone and more inclined, the people who are most inclined to vote for Biden are more inclined to pick up the phone and you may have some some error there. Is there, like, it's impossible for you to look at the... Yeah, let me get my crystal right ball now. out of the closet. And... Get your crystal ball and <laughs> sort of see where where potential concerns would be in this moment. But I would like to give you that opportunity. Like, if you were to say, this is what I'm concerned about polling in this moment, and, and, and we're not going to be able to have this kind of postmortem until it, it actually happens. But mm-hmm. do you have any concerns going in? Because we have sort of, after 2016, fo- more folks started waiting by education. Um, you know, And that didn't work. Yeah, and, and and at this point the pandemic is over. So presumably, if that was what caused it, then it won't be an issue in 2024. Where do we stand now? I'll just touch on one thing as I answer this. Uh, the, the other thing that gets constantly cited as a criticism of the average is this 2022, right? When you have um, a lot of polls by right-leaning pollsters. The averages were right in 22. Well, yeah, on average. And I won't sure. stand. And okay. I won't stand for the. <laughs> If you average across the state level errors, then sure. But there are there's a set of Senate races where there there is a right leaning bias in the average, and it comes from uh, pollsters uh, that you know were signaling that they were doing things differently to try to boost you know the voice of the low social trust or more Republican leaning voters by some weird method to back into that group, and they generated results that are more Republican leaning in an election when the other polls were good. So uh, the, the, way, the way that our model Over takes fighting, that... Like fighting the last battle. Yeah, those pollsters are fighting position. the last battle, and the averages weren't really enabled to handle that. Now, the way that our average works this year uh, combats this by considering uh, a national house effect for all the pollsters. If, if you're releasing you know, reliably Republican surveys in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Georgia and Arizona, right? You're going to get a, you're going to get a stronger house effect this year than the previous methodology would have given you. So I just kind of wanted to get that out of, out of the way since we were on, on, on a similar subject. We've, we've really tried to account for that. Now, again, as you raise, if all of the polls are biased because of the way people are answering phones or something uh, or filling out their online forms, is leading to bias. There's nothing we can do about that. We are we are at the mercy of good, high quality public opinion data in America, and we can try our best to discern the trends and the biased firms and the more accurate historical forms or firms or whatever. But at the end of the day, if all the polls are ten points off, the average is going to be somewhere between five and ten points off. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, but I, to get back to your question, I do think there are a couple of things to be worried about, um, and we're going to do more work looking into these over the course of the election, but to set the stage. Uh, I think there's a, a problem with the polls overrepresenting engaged Americans, which can typically be solved with waiting, but likely cannot be this year. Uh, as, um, as political divisions seem to be played out among, uh, you know, on the news, that would have a, a residual effect on uh, the types of people answering polls who really pay attention to the news and not necessarily the wider public. Uh, so when I was talking earlier about you have this group of Democrats who are sort of protest responding to the polling about, about Joe Biden, um, then that would, in that sense, cause a, a lower numbers for Biden than how they would actually vote. But uh, I'm, I'm also worried about just overall representativeness um, among the types of people who don't answer polls and don't typically turn out for elections. Uh, and those tend to be the same types of people. So that's the type of bias we saw, uh, or a similar to the type of bias we saw in 2020, uh, but it would be a little bit more exaggerated this time, uh, where polls are not representing the group of Americans who like aren't volunteering or aren't constantly po- posting about, about politics. And if those groups are like more impacted by inflation or just generally unhappy about this, the direction of things or involvement in foreign wars, right, then the polls would overestimate support for them, underestimating support for Republicans. So uh, I, I think that that, because these people would be more inclined to vote against the party in power is the idea. So I think we need to do some more work here. And again, our, our picture will become 
clearer before we get to the election. But of course, the caveat that you raise is we never really know what the direction of the polling error is going to be. So our forecast will be relatively agnostic to that. But uh, of course, the storytelling we tell about the you know, you know the reliability of the polling uh, is kind of uh, where all you know where we add a lot uh, when we engage in conversations like this. So, final question: If you could have one more piece of data, what would it be? I'd really like every poll in America to release the variables that they wait on. Um, so in 2016, we have this big bias concentrated among pollsters who weren't making sure there were enough non-college educated, especially white, but all voters in their samples. Um, knowing that ahead of time and and indexing on it, accounting for it in your average, right? Like putting more weight on the pollsters that were waiting by more variables or looking for systematic differences between polls with different weighting schemes uh, empirically really helps the way your model works. Um, and we can do some crude back testing for this, and it's it it will be a part of our forecasting model, it, where we take into account a group of pollsters that we think are doing things better, above and beyond how how we are rating you, um, and that has helped in out of sample elections in the past. Uh, but we don't have that granular of data at the poll level because lots of pollsters just don't tell us how they're doing their polls. Uh, I'm going to do a bonus here. Uh, lots of pollsters today are mixing methods. They are doing a poll over the phone and they're doing a poll online and they're doing a poll on text and they're squashing it together and calling it one poll. That's not really the way you want to go about this. You want to look for systematic differences between your methods, um, the types of people you're getting in different modes, especially among the subgroups, and then take those considerations into account in some sort of model in your weighting scheme and account for it. Uh, and that could lead to a lot of error this year too. So what you're saying is these pollsters are stealing your thunder. They're making an average of three polls before they ever give the poll to the aggregators themselves. They're polling the polls. Who who <laughs> fact checks the fact checkers? Who watches the watchers? Yeah. I mean, yes, yes. Po Actually, this is an important point for people to take home. And that is that, that polls are not static statistical objects. They are not, right? And I've written a book about this. They're not just interviews. They're not like just numbers that arise naturally from the population, their models. At the end of the day, a researcher has decided on some mental model or a literal model like we're doing to generate a number to report to people about the state of public opinion. Now, our job at 538 is to aggregate all those judgments because historically it's a little bit more reliable. Um, but people got to know, right? Like these numbers are not handed down by God. They're really potentially fallible. Um, and that's what I have a percentage point lead for Trump isn't written in the stars, Elliot. <laughs> I mean, but like, you know, some people aren't going to, I mean, our audience is smart enough to know that, but I think more, more people could hear that message. Um, and that's why we, that's why we have uncertainty intervals this year in the averages and while, while, and why we will really be embracing them in the forecast. Well, if this isn't a theme of so much of what we talk about on the podcast, which is it's not that this method is perfect. It's just that it's the least bad compared to all of the other ways of understanding an election. The alternatives like going to a suburb of Pittsburgh, walking down Main Street, talking to Betsy, John, and Susan about who they're going to vote for, and then coming to some conclusion about who's going to win Pennsylvania um, is far worse <laughs> than yeah. creating an Yard average... Yard signs, crowd volume measurement, Facebook likes... Whatever. It's not as good as literally asking people what they think. At the end of the day, that is a direct way of talking to people. In as close to a random representative sample as possible. Um, well, representative samples don't exist, but that's a subject for a whole nother podcast. Um, tell me more. Tell me more, Elliot. I mean, OK, we're going to get a hot take. Maybe people are going to be upset about this. It is empirically right, though. If, if only 1% or less of the people you are calling answer your survey, it is inherently unrepresentative. Uh, actually, most pollsters would probably agree with that. And so we shouldn't call well, them right, simple, random, the, you know, I mean, we shouldn't call them representative why, right. samples. Right, right. That's why people have to spend so much time waiting is because, well, actually, Elliot, I think it's complicated because it is no surprise the there not, we're so we're is, so straightforward here it's never complicated here it is definitely the case that it's not a representative sample if there's something unique about people who respond to polls which is to say and yes we know that there are trends in terms of who responds to polls but can we 
make enough calls that we can eventually reach all kinds of people amongst the population that responds to polls. It's kind of a pedantic it, argument. It's been it's been weirdly successful given that 99% of Americans are not responding to polls that just the percentage of Americans who respond to polls is representative enough to get us close to the answer. Yeah. So if you knew that 99 out of 100 people are not answering polls, you would think those freaks who are answering polls must be messing up all of the data that we have. And because of waiting and because of honestly, in some ways, just luck through the fact that if you call enough people, you will get enough diversity in the sample that you can come up with a close to accurate poll or reasonably accurate poll. Um, but it is true that there is something different about people who respond to polls versus the 99% of people who don't respond to polls. Let me just crystallize the argument. The, the argument is not that the polls can't up being predictive of unobserved quantity. In our case, typically election results, but like... What about the share of Americans who own a refrigerator? That's, that's important too. You got to get that right. Um, the claim is that the the method itself is not as inherently representative as as is indicated by the phrase representative sample. It it is not like on average prone to no bias, which is what you would expect if every person actually had an equal chance of responding to your poll. You have to do all this other stuff after the fact because it is inherently an unrepresentative thing. And you can get to a representative model, but the sample itself is not representative. That's pedantic, but there we go. Should we go back to door knocking, which is to say- Ooh, awesome. Uh, do you have pol $10 million? <laughs> Pollsters <laughs> Let's do it. just take a random walk through a neighborhood and knock on doors to get some answers. Random, um, random walk through Main Street, yeah. I mean, random walk through Main you, Street. Might, you might get a better- A memoir by Elliot Morris. Well, I I have to be clear that random walk through Wall Street is one of the more popular statistical, uh, statistical uh, Wall Street you know finance books. So it's not like I invented that title. <laughs> oh. uh, with that, Elliot, we're gonna say goodbye today. I'll remind folks that they can view these averages at 538.com, and that also if you have any questions about these averages or the election in general, podcast at 538.com or Twitter. For now, thank you, Elliot. Hey, thanks, Galen. My name is Galen Druk. Our producers are Shane McKeon and Cameron Tertavian, and our intern is Jayla Everett. Jesse DiMartino is on video editing. You can get in touch, like I mentioned, by emailing us at podcast at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>